Again tonight, we're going to go over to 2 Timothy, chapter 2, that's where we're starting, but tonight we're looking at election, the doctrine of election, uh, as defined by the hermeneutical principle or the law of first mention. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to the law of first mention tonight, otherwise, why that is such an important principle or law in the in biblical interpretation, otherwise understanding what God has said, rightly dividing the word of truth. So the Apostle Paul pins the words of 2 Timothy 2.14, uh, and it says, To his son in the faith, Timothy. I would think that that would mean that Paul probably led Timothy to Christ and discipled him, raised him up in the faith. He had some knowledge of the scriptures. He had learned the scriptures from his childhood. But these few verses in 2 Timothy 2.14-18 are incredibly important and certainly define the main responsibility of the faithful pastor teacher. One cannot teach right doctrine if one does not know right doctrine. So... Being able to rightly divide the word of truth is a precursor to the qualifications of a pastor. If he cannot rightly divide the word of truth, he's in trouble, right? Right from the beginning. Oftentimes what I'll do with young men who are who say they're gonna they want to be preachers is, is I'll give them a difficult text and I'll say, Okay, here, write a sermon on this and uh, explain what it says. For instance, Hebrews chapter 6, very difficult text. If you don't understand the context of the whole book of Hebrews, if you just go in and jump into Hebrews chapter 6, you're going to get in trouble big time if you don't have the context laid. So Paul had been a master now of Judaism. One, of course, he was Saul. And he was a master of Judaism's false doctrines of the Mosaic Covenant. He taught them to a lot of people. Paul's belief regarding the doctrine of salvation and the doctrine of grace when he was Saul were certainly completely wrong. He knew the Old Testament scriptures in great detail, more than likely had most of them memorized. However, most of the master teachers of Israel, like Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night, the other members of the Sanhedrin, who were all doctors of theology, and Paul, who probably was equally there, had it all wrong. Just because they had studied the Bible and had it memorized, in most cases, were they trustworthy to teach it? No, but the rest of the Jews, the majority of the Jews, listened to them and believed what they said as authoritative, and therefore were taught and raised in false doctrine. So when Paul pens the words of 2 Timothy 2, 14 through 18, he is writing them with the shame of his past ignorance burning in his heart. I, I, I'm, I, you know, as a pastor, I know over the years I've learned things that, uh, that later on that, that cancel out some of the things I used to teach when I was a young pastor, and I'm, I'm ashamed of those things. I should have, should have been more diligent in my study. But I believed somebody who I thought was an expert. That doesn't excuse it. And then I taught that false doctrine. Well, they weren't major false doctrines, but they were false doctrines. How many had Paul deceived in the past with his false teachings of Judaism? How many? How <laughs> many? 
the weight of having taught some false doctrines way heavy upon the heart of the man of God that later learns right doctrine. He doesn't want to ever make that mistake again. And so he is diligent and careful and meticulous in his study of the Word of God. Hours are going to be spent because he's going to teach it to people who will teach others also. So surely this must have been a great burden, a burning burden upon Paul's heart. Right doctrine. And surely Paul would want to caution the preachers that would follow him in the generations of the future about rightly dividing the word of truth. That is a major part of this second epistle of Tim to Timothy. So this is a great burden on those with a heart for God. Laboring in the word and doctrine, 2 Timothy 5.17, is an essential because we, produce, we reproduce what we believe in those we teach. I know Summer's here tonight. I'm sure she comes because she trusts me, right? She trusts the pastor that she goes when she goes to church at, in uh, Wisconsin when she goes back to college. We trust the people that we set under their ministry because we believe they labor in the word and doctrine, make sure they get it right. This instructive and cautionary word of 2 Timothy 2.15 from God, through Paul, to Timothy, and then to all of us down through the centuries, are incredibly and critically important words, especially for pastors, especially for men who are going to stand behind a pulpit or teach your Sunday school class, or teach others also. Incredibly important. Look there again to 2 Timothy 2.4. 14. We'll read this text and have a word of prayer. Paul says, Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but the subverting of the hearers. Don't talk about stuff that make no, makes no difference. Who cares how many angels can stand on the head of a pin? Right? You? I don't. It makes absolutely no difference. Then he comes to this verse. And here's what you should do. Study. To show thyself approved unto God. Otherwise, it, the getting it right is between you and God. So you better start talking to God about it when you go to the Word of God. You better ask Him to let you know what's right. Get the uh, teaching of the Spirit of God, uh, uh, you know, First Timothy two, yeah, or First First Corinthians two. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be what ashamed. Now I believe that was the Apostle Paul after uh, after he got saved. He was ashamed of the things that he had taught. It was, it was ashamed of it. And then he said, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, obviously, if you can rightly divide it, you can wrongly divide it. And then he says, but shun profane and vain babblings, empty babblings, empty, just small talk. For they will increase unto more ungodliness. Spend most time, many people spending most time making speculations about God instead of the clear explanation of what God has said. And their word will eat it, that's a canker of whom is Hymenius and Philetus, who concerning the truth of error, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. They destroyed what they do, they taught a false doctrine because they didn't rightly divide the word of truth, because that their heart wasn't concerned about really what God said. They had this idea and they began to teach it. Even though we know that the resurrection was not past, it's not past now. But here it is, they overthrow the faith of some. Catastrophe is this word overthrow. They catastrophize the faith, the faith of some. Make a catastrophe out of right doctrine. And in doing so, they make catastrophes out of the lives of people.
Father, we just pray tonight that you'd help us have understanding of these truths. You'd help us to establish these simple principles in the lives of men here and the women. And pray that, Lord, we would indeed rightly divide the word of truth as we lay these foundations for a study of the doctrine of election in the Bible. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Now, let me say right up front, there is no place in the ministry for lazy students of God's word who do not know how to gather the exact meaning of what God has said and who cannot explain that meaning through preaching and teaching. Your first job is to get what God has said. Once you've gotten got what God has said, then you are responsible to be able to explain that to people who have really, in many cases, no knowledge of God at all and persuade them to believe it. That's the job of the preacher teacher. But it all begins with getting it right from God. Being able to exact the meaning of what God wrote uh, at the time of history that he wrote it in the context of which he wrote it. And being able to bring that back into the people, explain it and make applications for modern day culture. I believe one of the qualifications of a pastor is detailed in 2 Timothy 2.24 is he must be apt to teach. Look at that. Look at that text. 2 Timothy 2.24 And the servant of the Lord must not strive but be gentle unto all men. Otherwise he's not out there just taking on arguments. He's proclaiming the truth. Now there's going to be a lot of disagreements when you teach the truth. There's going to be resistance and arguments. That doesn't mean you have to get in them. Uh, you have to get involved with them. You say, well, this is thus saith the Lord. Take it or leave it. You have to be gentle with all men. And then it says this, apt to teach and then the qualifier patient. Those two things go together. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. And that's what most people do. They oppose themselves. Why? Why do you have to be meekness doing this? Because if God, for adventure, will give them to repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Who's going to do that? That's an operation of God in the heart. That's conviction. That's a moving of the Spirit of God. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Now notice God's not recovering them. God's provided everything that's necessary for them to be recovered, but they must respond by an action of the will. Faith is a choice. And then it says, who are taken captive by him at his will. That's the devil that takes him captive. Now look at those words apt to teach, translated from the Greek word didactikos. That's a word from which we get our English word didactic. I would ask you to define and give me, you know, somebody stand up and give me a good definition of didactic. Most of us don't even know what that word is. So let me explain it to you. The fo focus of didactic teaching is to slowly, meticulously, ensure that the student is grasping what is being taught with the intent the substance can then be reproduced through the student as he commits now to faithful men who should be able to teach others. It is not the dumping of all that you know. And so there are times when I have taught a congregation and I might say, well, there's about 10 people that got what I said tonight. I look out in the congregation, there's about 10 people that were listening and heard, maybe out of 200, 250 people. And I might come back at that another time and take another run at it from another portion of Scripture and teach it again. And maybe another 10 or 20 people we're going to get. And I, I realize that the high probability is most people don't hear uh, with the student's mind. Now, I learned very early that when you are doing deep studies in the things of God and you're listening to someone lecture, I do so with the pen in my hand and the paper in my lap. And I'm taking notes and I'm writing things down. And uh, some guys, you don't need to take any notes. They're not saying anything. Some guys, you can't keep up with them. I remember uh, 
I had a man who was a good friend of mine. Uh, uh, he came and preached, and I just would ask him questions, and I'd sit across the table as he ate and had a discussion every breakfast, noon, and dinner. And uh, he preached for a week in our church, and i just write down the things he said. I'd ask more questions. And uh, it was a very valuable time. Therefore, the word patience added to the qualification. Why? Because it has to be slow. It has to be meticulous. You have to make sure they understand. You have to understand, make sure they're getting it. There has to be sometimes a personal conversation with them. There has to be a time when they call you up and they say, I don't understand that. Can you come over and answer some questions for me? Be right there. Be glad to. That is what APTA teaches about. But you can't do it if you haven't done, if you haven't got it. I uh, I told a man he said boy I listened to a man preach, uh, and uh, he preached for an hour and a half didn't say anything, and I answered simply you know he can't give you what he hasn't got. He didn't go and get anything from the scriptures and so he didn't have anything to give. So patient is added now before any pastor can be apt to teach, he must be skilled and ready to teach by careful and meticulous labor first in rightly dividing the word of truth. Most of your preaching preparation is done in the study, and it takes hours and hours and hours. And a day's church where the pastor is supposed to do everything in the church, he does all the visitation, he does uh, you know, most of the chores, praise God, we don't have that here. we got a lot of people who do a lot of things, which frees me up time to what? Labor in the Word and Doctrine. But you have to have that. Therefore, the elders, pastors that rule well, shall be counted worthy of double honor. You know what that means? Worthy of double the money they're paid. doesn't mean they're going to get it, <laughs> but they, they're worthy of it. Worthy means they're worth. They're worth double what many times they're being paid. <laughs> Especially they who labor in the word of doctrine. They labor in it. That is the person who is apt to teach. You're going to be apt to teach. Remember, you've got to labor in the word of doctrine. Lazy Bible studies will be worthless Bible teachers and should never be allowed behind a pulpit to preach or teach. Now, learning the governing principles of biblical hermeneutics, the science of interpretation, interpreting by the Bible, should be one of the highest priorities for any man desiring the office of a bishop. A foundational rule of biblical hermeneutics or interpretation is known as the law of first mention. I've said this before many times. You spend four years in Bible college, and then the last year you might get a course one one. Uh, you know, one or two credit hours on hermeneutics, study how to study the Bible, how to how to how to interpret the Bible, <laughs> and they've already been taught what what to believe, but haven't been taught whether or not how to check it, find out if it's true. I'll give you a note from the 1917 edition of the Schofield Refer Bible. That's the one I use. Don't. I don't believe the notes and the references in the Scofield Reference Bible are inspired, but I believe that a very high percentage of them are correct, and they'll be very valuable for you. There are a few that will throw you off greatly if you don't uh, be careful. But uh, it was uh, said of, I can't remember who it was, uh, uh, well, I'll, if I can't remember, I probably better not say let me give you this quote from, from uh, Schofield. Now, this is very important because he really he is stating the law of first mention here. Genesis is the book of beginnings. It records not only the beginning of the heavens and the earth and of plant, animal, and human life, but also of all human institutions and relationships. Typically, it speaks of the new birth, the new creation, where all is chaos and ruin, when Genesis begins also that progressive revelation of God which culminates in Christ, the three primary names of deity, Elohim, 
Jehovah and Adonai, and the five most important of the compound names occur, occur in Genesis, and that in an ordered progression which could not be changed without confusion. Otherwise, they come together in an ordered progression. You wouldn't understand the last if you didn't understand the first. The problem of sin as uh, affecting man's condition in the earth and his relationship, to, his relation to God, and the divine solution of that problem are here in essence. Of the eight great covenants which condition human life and divine redemption, four, the Adamic, Adamic, Noat, Noic, and the Abrahamic covenants are in this book. And these are found fundamental covenants to which the other four, the Mosaic, Palestinian, Davidic, and new covenants are related chiefly as adding uh, detail or development. Genesis enters into the very structure of the New Testament, in which it is quoted about 60 times in 17 books. In a profound sense, therefore, the roots, look at this, the roots of all subsequent revelation are planted deep in Genesis. That's the law of first mention. And whosoever would truly comprehend that revelation must begin here. The inspiration of Genesis and its and it character as a divine revelation are authenticated by the testimony of Christ. And it gives a number of references there. Uh, Genesis is in five divisions. We have creation, the fall and redemption, the diverse seeds, Cain and Seth to the flood, the flood to Babel, and uh, from the call of Abraham to the death of Joseph. And then the concluding statement says that events recorded in Genesis cover a period of 2,315 years. It's the longest span of time uh, in recorded history that is right there in one book of the Bible. And that, of course, is to Usher's, uh, according to Usher's chronology. Now he has, of course, Laying to some degree his foundations for his gap theory here in this statement. And he's talking about the new creation and not the new creation. It isn't the one, um, you know, where uh, the earth was made void and, and uh, the, the word made there can't, can't be translated that. The word was, the earth was void, was not made void. Now he's accurately in establishing the biblical hermeneutics here of the law first mentioned. So he says here, this is what this is a critical statement in that statement. In a profound sense, therefore, the roots of all subsequent revelation are planted deep in Genesis, and whosoever would truly comprehend that revelation must begin here. Now if you're going to be a Bible student, you better get a hold of the book of Revelation. Because there's a lot there. Now let's look at the hermeneutical law of first mention. Now what is a hermeneutics? The science of biblical interpretation. How do we rightly divide the word of truth? That's, a, that's what hermeneutics is. It is applying rules or laws to rightly dividing the word of truth. Getting out from the Bible what God has said. Now, that's, that, we'll look at this one first. Often people give meaning to words that are not consistent with God's original and contextual use, especially readers that begin reading the Bible with old, without Old Testament foundations of understanding. So the law of first mention understands that every doctrine of Scripture in its simplest form finds its origin in the book of Genesis. Many people say in the first 12 chapters. Now, certainly it's there in the whole book. But the law of first mention requires the person seeking to rightly divide the word of truth to begin with the first mention of any doctrine in the Bible to discover the fundamental meaning inherent in the first occurrence. So next week, that's what we're going to do. We're going to go find and find the first occurrence of the word election in the Old Testament. And we're going to find out what it means in that context and then instead of coming back to it with presuppositions, we're going to establish that context and take it throughout the Bible. Because we have 
literally at least probably a hundred verses of scripture that teach what election is and it is not God choosing anyone to be saved. So the law of first mention requires a person seeking to rightly divide the word of truth to begin with the first mention of any doctrine in the Bible to discover the fundamental meaning inherent in that first occurrence. And although later occurrence may add clarity, meaning, definition, or extension, the later occurrences will never change the original meaning to be different from the original intent and the original occurrence. So anytime you're looking at a doctrine, look it up, look, look at where it's found first in the book of Genesis. Find out what God has said there. So the original meaning is always present within the later occurrence. The fundamental truth of original occurrence or the law of first mention will always be the dominant meaning. And the doctrine may expand in clarity and definition, but it will never change in that God does not change. Who wrote the book? God. Is God a bunch of inconsistencies and incoherencies and contradictions? Of course not. This would be especially important as we look at God's choosing and electing in the Old Testament books. And we will see that it does not in any way align with what the Calvinists teach. Or the Armenians, because they believe people are elected to be saved too. It's not used that way in the Bible. <laughs> Never once. <laughs> I've had discussions with uh, Calvinists online, very places, debates, and I said, show me one time in the Bible where God says he has chosen anyone to be saved. And they have one verse of scripture in 2 Thessalonians where they say God has chosen you to salvation. What is that salvation? That's the end of your salvation. That is your glorification. That's that part of salvation. I said, really? You really? You're going to build a whole doctrine from that one word when everything else before that Completely says something different, completely. But when you're blind to see what the word of God says and only want to see what you believe, say, you won't listen and hear. Now here we must also caution against what uh, is called monothetic definitions of words. A monothetic definition of a word, mono means one, thetic means definition. So, we take a word from, uh, any word can be anything, and we give it a one meaning. But we know that as the, uh, are certain things innate to a word and the definition of that word, there are also variations to that definition varying context. Uh, context can paint different word pictures. For instance, the phrase, See the boy running paints a different word picture than the phrase my egg is running or my nose is running. Right? Both are derivative of the same word run, but the use in different contexts radically changed the word portrait before us. Now second caution against a tendency to begin our understanding of Old Testament books from the context of our understanding of the New Testament writings. Most people will spend most of their time in the New Testament. I spent most of my time in the uh, establishing doctrine, especially when I wrote my uh, doctrinal uh, um, position for defense for ordination, I spent much time in the Old Testament beginning with Old Testament text and then building and giving support from later future or the, or the law of recurrence, later statements, which, of course, are similar to the original. But there is a tendency to interpret the Old Testament from the New Testament rather than interpreting the New Testament from the already established truths of the Old Testament. That is the way it should be. We interpret the New Testament from the Old Testament. There may be many mysteries that are obscure in the Old Testament books that are revealed later in the New Testament books, but generally we interpret the New Testament books from the Old Testament books. And although the New Testament may clarify 
of what the Old Testament teaches. It never contradicts what the Old Testament teaches. There can be additional revelation added to what God has said in the Old Testament. But it will never contradict what God has said in the Old Testament. Now, etymology, the true etymology, etymology is a study of the history of a word. How was it used originally? There is a biblical etymology and there is a historical etymology. If we want to have a biblical etymology, we go find the first occurrence of that word in the Bible and we build an etymology as that bot, that word is used throughout the rest of the scripture. So the true biblical etymology, def, etymological definition of a word, can only be determined by discovering the meaning of the word inductively. Otherwise, looking at its use throughout the Bible. And this is, of course, what word studies are for. I have a number of word study books in my library. Volumes of them, in fact. I probably have um, at least five, maybe as many as ten. But every lexicon and uh, concordance uh, is, to some degree, a, a word study, uh, etymology study of words in the Bible and how they're used. Now, why is this true? Because God has said, I am, uh, for I am the Lord, I change not. So God's doctrine is not going to change, and his word use is not going to use, change. But God will use the same word in different contexts and with different meaning. That's therefore uh, removes the idea of a monothetic definitions. James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is where? Where does it come? From above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. His shadow doesn't even move when it comes to the truth. Okay, now let's look at one more law. The hermeneutical law of what? Recurrence. Okay, we have a doctrine taught in one place in the Bible, the first occurrence. The law of first mention. Then we come to another place where that is taught again. We have now the law of recurrence. The hermeneutical law of recurrence is an inseparable partner to the law of first mention. They are, they work hand in hand. Often in the Bible we find a new historical account of something previously revealed or discussed in scripture. Now get this. The repetition of such an account may give added details that the previous count did not provide. Each mention of such historical events, doctrines, or word, a word use, must be carefully researched to discover the context and if added details are provided. This is also known as what? An inductive methodology. Otherwise, you get the, uh, you get the whole by finding all the parts. So an inductive methodology or inductive Bible study is going into the Bible and finding everywhere in the Bible that that is mentioned. Every first mention and every recurrence and finding every single one. And now from that you put all these parts together and now you have found the whole. That's an inductive methodology. And don't confuse that with deductive inductive logic. Those are philosophical ideas. An inductive methodology is how we study the Bible. So if I'm not clear upon a doctrine, where do I go? I go to Braden's and we sit down and talk about it? I could. Probably could he'd probably give me some insight. But if I'm going to be a man who rightly divides the word of truth, I better learn how to look it up in the Bible and find every recurrence and study it, and then find the next recurrence and study it. Now, we don't, we, we take for granted the tools we have today. A reference Bible, for instance, that will give you a whole list of recurrences where that was found. We, we don't have to read the whole Bible. Now, we should, but the point is, we have reference Bibles and tools. Uh, 
um, the, the one one of the scripture knowledge, uh, the treasure of scripture knowledge, which is just uh, uh, everything there is about the doctrine of recurrence, the law of recurrence. And so it'll give you the original one, and it'll give you a whole chain of references where it occurs again. Somebody did a lot of work to do that. Lazy people don't use those books. Now, granted, maybe they're not always, the references aren't always correct, and they're a different use, but somebody did a lot of work. And why is it that every generation thinks they have to reinvent the wheel? Every one of us throughout our lives are going to be men who, especially preachers, who stand on somebody else's shoulders, who taught us, and we teach others also. That's what the whole thing means. Somebody taught us. And now we teach others also. But eventually, if you're going to be a pastor, you've got to learn to be able to get it for yourself. You've got to be able to go in and say, well, I'm not sure I got this right. Or maybe this guy taught me wrong. And I've got to be able to go in the Bible and find out if he's right. That's hermeneutics. An accurate understanding will come when we gather all the scriptural evidence to a particular subject or doctrine. This process is what defines the doctrine and what allows the exegete, the person who is getting it out from the Bible, to become dogmatic about any given subject or doctrine. Somebody will come to me and they say, well, you know, here, what have you ever thought about this? I said, yes, I have. And, uh, they say, well, uh, let me, let me, let me, let me teach you what I think I've, I've, I've uh, learned here. And uh, when they get all done, I said, well, no, that's wrong. Well, you need to open your mind. I said, well, I've opened my mind to that a long time ago. I've studied it all out, and you're wrong. What you're teaching is wrong. You better go back and study it again. Here is why, and I can tell them why. Now, let's come back to an inductive methodology again. An inductive methodology reasons from the parts, the pieces, to the whole. So you're just starting out with parts. You notice that when I preach, I give you what? Bible verses. I give you parts. And then I do what? I give you another part. And then I do what? I give you another part. And I give enough witnesses or testimonies to ensure that you can see the whole. So from particulars to general, occlusion is drawn from the weight of all evidence. An inductive methodology is primary to avoiding eisegesis. That's reading a presupposition into. That's what eisegesis means. You've read it into the Bible. Uh, systematic theologies are conclusive and dogmatic statements based upon the weight of scriptural evidence arrived at through the inductive exegesis, extracting what God is saying out from what the Bible says. Of every Bible text, the doctrine of recurrence, to that theological statement. Now that's a loaded statement. <laughs> but this is categorically different than proof texting or deductive methodology. Otherwise taking one verse out of the scripture, interpreting what that word of that verse of scripture means, without taking it in the context of the book it is written, then in the context of the rest of the Bible. Sometimes I listen to people preach, and I do a lot. I listen to a lot of different guys preach. Some of them are just tremendous. Some of them are, they, they, they make me ashamed sometimes of, of what they know compared to, although I've been in the ministry a lot of times, to just see, man, they just really know the Word of God. And boy, I'm so blessed by that. But guess what? I listen to them a lot. They can help me grow. Now, that doesn't mean I expect reciprocity that they listen to me. They probably don't even know what I am, and I'm not really concerned about that. I find men to listen to who are going to help me, and who I think know how to do, do biblical interpretation right. And when all these checks and balances are carefully applied to every text, and a correct understanding of the various texts are added together, we can be confident We've determined what God wants us to know. In other words, it can be said that the word of God has been rightly divided. 
Now, if we have contradictions between texts, we have an error in our exegesis somewhere. The Bible is not, doesn't contradict itself. Harmony of truth must exist before we can claim to have a true systematic theology and that God is not the author of confusion. I read Calvin's Institutes and it seems like I'm, I'm reading the guy who's having an argument with himself. Even much of what he says doesn't work with what he says it says. Now let me close with this. If we want to understand God's choosing or election according to his sovereign purpose, we must begin with the first occurrence and its use in the scripture, the law of first mention, and build inductively from that point forward in this inductive approach, we should be able to discover a common meaning if a common meaning occurs consistent in the scriptures, the law of recurrence. And over and over and over again, this is the redundancy of Bible study. To take a doctrine where the scripture says the scriptures are of no private interpretation, otherwise they interpret themselves. And that is how you do that is through inductive Bible study using the laws of hermeneutics.